to you all on behalf of SAMRAL. We are thrilled to be here this morning um, to have this opportunity to engage with you as engineering students. We thank Dr. Darlington, the head of the Department of Civil Engineering. We are also grateful to Professor Fulu, who is your Dean of Engineering, for giving us this opportunity to come here and engage with you. And why is it important for us as Sanral to come here and give this lecture? Well, what we'd like to do is we would like to build a bridge. We'd like to build a bridge between where you are as engineers who are studying or making decisions about your future careers and also building perceptions about areas that you may want to specialize into and what happens in industry. We'd like to make that connection between what you're learning and the theory that you are exposed to in the academic environment and what the real world of work looks like and how what you're learning is actually applied, what that journey looks like from academia into, into the world of work. We'd also like to build awareness among you about what Sanwell does, about the impact of some of the projects that we have uh, running, some of the most important of which are in this very province um, and important not just on an engineering scale, but are also important for the economy of this country, but indeed also the economy of the entire sub-region. So we are really happy for this uh, engagement, and um, we have a number of speakers who will be coming up and, say, and, and presenting different aspects of this lecture to you. But to start off with, I'd like to invite Dr. Darlington to come and say a few words to open. Thank you.
students, as you can see, industry and academia. Um, students need the technical skills, as you can see on the screen, lateral thinking, understanding of systems, uh, dynamics, preparing projects and deliverables. This is all what you are learning here, right? You're learning all this. With you. Uh, we want you to become highly trained individuals by the time you leave the university. Those are our exit level outcomes, or which is also integrated into the DUT graduate attributes, right? And then we have the industry on the left here. They do supervise students in projects, corporate training, support and finance projects, uh, resource sharing, and industrializing. In this case, the industry here will be what? Sandra. And then we have academia in general, which engages uh, indust industry or industrial professionals, industry relevance in research, student counseling, creative thinking lessons, policy constraints, and when you, when you guys go up, you will begin to deal more with research. Okay. Now, universities serve the industry in two ways. Okay. It provides workforce necessary to run industry. Okay. And two, it furnishes industry you know, innovative ideas, right? To start new businesses new business uh, ventures. Right. This, this, this might look very simple, um, simplistic uh, kind of relationship, but it doesn't work uh, so simplistically in reality because of the inherent differences between the two, which is what university, uh, universities desire to contribute to theory, obviously. But what does industry want? On the other hand, industry is restrained to what? Profitability. Industry has to balance the profit. If there is no profit, then there is no industry because they need to survive. Everything here costs money. Even the guy looking at me through technology, it doesn't just come from the air, right? So therefore, academia and industry are analogous the two sides of a river, okay? Two sides of a river that must flow independently. Uh, I need to watch my time. As far as science is concerned, can you guys hear me at the back? Okay. As far as science is concerned, disciplines are concerned. Creating linkage between the two sides of the river has the potential to the betterment uh, of both, which is industry and universities. Now, maybe I'm going a bit too deep for you guys, uh, but um, there was a model uh, by Connor in 2009 that industry, industry needs are based on what? Five factors for success, okay? And this is uh, the need for orientation, industry goal alignment, development impact, industry benefits, and innovation. Now it focuses on research actions, also five, like what? Management engagement, network access, collaborator match, okay? Um, well, if I have time, I will explain all this. Communication, ability, and continuity. And um, this is my last page. I don't want you to, to be bored. So we recognize that education must adjust itself to industry and job market. Okay? But this process requires consolidated uh, representation of fields and teaching programs. With this, I'll say thank you. Um, so basically, this industry uh, collaboration is today the 
leaders. Today's lecture is the start of this collaboration between DUT, Sandra, and um, I would like to encourage us to ask as many questions when, when, the, when the time for questions come. Put your questions in your mind for Sandra. You can write them, you have papers, uh, books to write. Um, write your questions, anything that you would like to ask. So, the fact, uh, I understand that most of the majority of you here are NS4 students who are about to exit the system and maybe go work for Sandra. So ask your questions, feel free. No question is stupid. Thank you very much once again. anywhere on the road, on the national road network, you may be using a Sanwell road. And what we'd like to do with this next um, video is to give you an idea of the world of Sanwell in images. I they say success doesn't just happen, that it happens by design. It's about seeing the bigger dream, pushing the envelope, and of course, good old hard work. This is what we're built on. At Sunra, we're about more than just changing our country's landscape with bitumen and concrete. We're about changing our people's lives, opening new routes that will connect people to people, businesses to businesses, and workers to job opportunities. From Messina to Mabatu, Springbok to Saldana, Khan Spy to Richards Bay, and anything in between. The men and women of Sunwell work to build South Africa's future. Our national roads carry more than 70% of long distance road freight, contributing directly to economic growth for South Africa and neighboring countries. Over the past five years, our focus has been on maintaining our road network, keeping it top condition. The N2 Wild Coast is one of Sunral's most ambitious projects. It connects no less than four provinces, the Western Cape, Eastern Cape, KwaZulu Natal and Mpumalanga. When finished, it will open up the coastal strip between Port St. John's and Port Edward and provide a faster link to Durban, East London and Kaleha, improving the lives of those who live and work along the East Coast. When partnered with the majestic 518-meter Sigawa Bridge, which is scheduled to be the second longest span crossing ever built in Africa, the Wild Coast is set to truly come alive. Just 50 kilometers outside of Durban on the M3 is the improved Hammersdale Interchange, one of our newest projects. With key distribution warehouses being built in the area, Samra, in partnership with the Etewini municipality, has upgraded the diamond interchange to build six new on and off ramps that will accommodate the increased volume of traffic on this route. Kimberley, the capital and the largest city of the Northern Cape, is most famous for the Big Hole, a landmark carved into the earth by early diamond prospectors. In 2018, the region was given a much needed boost with the conversion of intersections to traffic circles, making it safer and more attractive to investors in the area. 33 million rand was spent on SMME contractor development, with 11 SMMEs getting economic and developmental opportunities. In 2020, we also wrapped up the upgrade of the M7 that links Cape Town with our neighbours in Namibia. It is now a safe dual carriageway. For our efforts, we even scooped the prestigious Fulton Award for Excellence in the Use of Concrete. The M7 is now a world-class freeway. For Limpopo, roads play a critical role in business, tourism, agriculture and mining. This is why projects that were once placed on hold were resumed. 
we worked hard to complete the Polokwane and Messina ring roads, improving the traffic flow on the N1, and of course, making it safer in response to the cries from the people in the area. In fact, the Presidency recognized the N1 Lucina Ring Road and the Polokwane Eastern Ring Road as key strategic integrated projects. Black-owned and women-owned SMEs now get to participate in construction and road maintenance projects, acquiring skills that will help them grow. So bolstered our skills development initiatives by establishing the Technical Excellence Academy in Gabeja where we take graduates on their journey to professional registration. As a state-owned organization, we are here to help develop our country's knowledge economy in order to unlock the potential that lies within the road construction industry. Our world-class freeway management system is a centrally operated system that assists motorists to better navigate their way through traffic, giving them up to the minute information on travel incidents on our freeways. We've also developed an innovative ticketing system to help South African commuters to use one smart card to pay for different modes of transport. Together with our stakeholders, we worked hard to adopt the Sustainable Roads Forum to promote the use of sustainable best practices in the planning, design, and construction of roads. We're proud to say we've piloted the tool on the N3 corridor upgrade between Durban and Peter Maritzburg. This is the new Sandrail, where innovation flourishes. In the past five years, we've put more emphasis in supporting our government in the fight against poverty in order to improve the lives of South Africans. In everything we do, we prioritize community development. We believe that communities should receive lifelong benefits that contribute to a better life. We created platforms that encourage small, medium and micro enterprises to work with Sanra, especially on our routine road maintenance work. We make sure that where possible, pedestrian facilities and safe access points for communities that live next to the road network are developed. As an SOE, we are aware of the role that education plays in changing lives, when in the past, we funded students who wanted to pursue engineering studies. We have recently opened up bursaries and scholarships to include all underprivileged students, irrespective of the career path they want to pursue. In 2019, we held a roundtable engagement with the South African Women in Construction to find ways on how we can help further advance the interests of women in the construction industry. This is just one example of how we live up to the promise of our transformation policy. Sunra, bold, brave, ambitious, and on the road to success. is responsible for managing and ensuring that the, San, the work of SANRAL um, is undertaken, implemented, the projects, um, the maintenance, um, and all of the different activities take place as they should within that region. And so here in Durban, we are in what's called the Eastern region. And, oh sorry, we're in Peter Maritzburg. <laughs> um, we are in the eastern region, and the eastern region is composed of KwaZulu Natal and the Free State. And today we have Krishna Naidu from the eastern region office, who's going to talk to you in a little bit more detail about what engineering at Sanra looks like. Krishna? So, uh, 
Good morning. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Just a formal correction. It's PR taken, it's not PRH. Uh, it makes a difference to you all, right? PRH, PR taken. It does. Um, so the little exercise that we went through this morning, is that now finished? Completed? All of the papers are on the one side. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. You, you now put in writing your struggle that you go through in order to get an education, your dedication to our industry. And Senral, as Senral, we really appreciate that. We need new people, we need additional people, we need professional people, we need smart people. And just by your sheer determination, um, I can see that uh, you are committed to joining our industry and making our industry better. So we welcome you to our industry. We're looking forward to seeing you on our sites and our uh, offices and uh, at the, the uh, conferences and the industry events. So uh, on with my presentation, so apologies from uh, Mr. Inkabinda, he couldn't quite be here today. Uh, quite a bit of this information has been put together by himself and uh, I've added on some, some bits and pieces. So, so the, my pride for, uh, uh, with working for Senal comes from exactly this. This is the footprint that we have within the country. And uh, your little journey from, from home to this institution is something that many others do day in and day out. Two of the issues that you would have, have considered uh, in, 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 in recording your journey is the, possibly the time, the number of modes that you take, as well as the cost. And quite a number of South Africans face the same uh, challenges, the same uh, choices, the same opportunities. It's up to you to make certain that some of the issues that you have now raised as challenges or, or as opportunities, you are either leveraging or preparing yourself to overcome them. Quite important for yourself to come to that realization as you join the industry. Um, so our, our, our network is pretty, pretty large. Uh, internationally, we sit around about 11, 10, depends on which day of the week you speak to whoever, but uh, we're pretty up there. Uh, if you consider that there's how many number of countries in the world? No one More than 10? Yeah, more than 10. Um, we, we, we're not too bad. But this also indicates that it's a massive, massive challenge as well as opportunity for us. If we have this bigger road network, it means that we have an enormous engineering challenge. But the road network has developed, but there's lots more opportunity to develop further. And you will see what I'm talking about. So from a central perspective, there's 22 odd thousand road, paved roads. The provinces have 46 odd thousand paved roads. And this is an opportunity, 226 odd thousand kilometers of unpaved roads. So if any of you this morning have recounted that you go from some place that has an unpaved road into a paved road network, you would understand the opportunity that I'm talking about. If any of you, like myself, who's been born and grown up in an area where the roads went from unpaved to paved, you know what I'm talking about. The opportunity is there for us to develop our country, to develop our society, as well as de develop our economy, just by way of unpaved roads. Metros, there's uh, 51 odd thousand, but there's also 14 odd thousand of, of uh, unpaved roads. And this, if you consider it, most of the, um, the provincial roads are rural, most of the, uh, the uh, metros are urban and the density, the population density that we have in an urban area, there's far more number of people that are affected by unpaved roads in an urban situation than in a rural situation. But that's not to say that rural roads are any less important. It's just a, a technical issue that I'm pointing out to yourselves. And then municipalities. Uh, in total, we're looking at about 750,000 odd kilometers of roads in our country. Massive opportunity for our industry, if we look at it right. Then some ask about uh, uh, the value of our no road network. It's probably about 413 odd billion. This was probably early last year or something like that. But 87% of it is funded by Treasury, a grant directly from Treasury. And only 13% is from TOP. Quite an important distinction. 7% uh, of that is the tolls, is managed directly by ourselves. 
So some of you who may join the industry and work for us or on one of our projects, you may well also work for a top concession as well. And 6%, sorry, 7% is managed by ourselves, 6% is managed by private toll concessionaires. And that, that figure may be changing because some of the concessions are coming to an end. Um, this is our structure, uh, fairly, fairly open. Most of you who Google this would have seen this. Minister of Transport, that's NDOT. And then Samuel itself is run by a board of directors. Uh, we have our CEO that takes care of governance and control. <coughs> and then we have an exco, and that's getting a little bit bigger because of our uh, wider mandate, if I can put it that way. Staff 475 uh, and counting. I think with Rwanda, it makes it 476, Rwanda, since you know. She's still so thinking about it. So Rwanda Sigati there, she's probably the brightest <coughs> young lady here that I've known in a long time. She's going to be addressing you in the next address. And I'll keep pointing to her very uncomfortably as well. In our region, we have about 120 odd staff uh, that uh, take care of, of things in our region. This is in Tsukaba, you've seen it in the other video. I'm not going to go over that. And these are some of our success stories as well. Highways, interchanges, rural access roads. This is a kind of road infrastructure that we get involved in. Bridges, roads, interchanges, tunnels, pedestrian overpasses. Pedestrian overpasses is quite an important thing for us as well. We need to take care, as one of the colleagues will speak about a little bit later on, safety is paramount to, our, to us and our infrastructure and our people as well. Uh, speaking about safety, quite a number of the pedestrian accesses and the uh, walkways and the overpasses is uh, motivated by taking care of safety. Top plazas, most of you have seen this. Uh, your experiences have been great, wonderful and most excellent. Most of you, I know, you enjoy paying for top plazas. <laughs> innovation, we have an innovation center. I don't want to bore yourselves with this. I want to try and get down to brass stacks. There's also smart mobility, some like the tech approach. Uh, data, I just want to wanna maybe uh, uh, touch on this point. You are data generators, you are scientists. Your future is going to be data driven. You're going to take in data, you're going to process data, and you're going to put out data. Everything that you do is going to base, be based on data. Your little exercise this morning is based on empirical data. That's, that's the experience that we went through this morning. So as scientists, as engineers, this is the, uh, the new world that you face with data, very, very da uh, data intensive. It is a resource, it is an asset, and it must be leveraged. Uh, uh, road network management, uh, I mentioned some of these things previously. We have management systems, bridge management systems, pavement management, as well as uh, slope management systems. I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Maintenance, uh, Luanda may touch on that a little bit, but. Uh, a lot of people may think that uh, counting potholes may well be a good thing, but it is the consequence. It's not the cause. So, uh, from a central perspective, uh, our intention is to make certain that we drive towards addressing the causes. Um, a little top tip for yourselves, root cause analysis is quite an important thing for us within, within our space. And I would urge you to research a little bit into that. Research and innovation, this is the second iteration of our research panel, a national research panel. Some of you from your uni may well be on the research panel. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's based on a whole number of focus areas. Um, I want to perhaps bring your attention to focus area three, four, and yeah, three and four. That's primarily where I'm involved. There are other colleagues that are involved in some of the other focus areas as well. Within that space, we have researchers, leading experts nationally. They go through a process of tendering, and then they get selected, and then they get appointed to be, uh, to be researching uh, central needs, requirements, and uh, things that can maybe take us a little bit forward. Transformation policy. I think it's us being here is tangible uh, uh, demonstration that uh, we, we don't just put these words up. We actually walk the talk. And uh, people like uh, Luanda, she's, 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 she's uh, a walking embodiment of what we would like to see as transformation in our industry. So these, these are words, but uh, I'm standing here, Luanda will be standing here just now, and, and I hope that you, you, you see that these words here are, are, are action, not just, just words on a, on a piece of paper. 
Then from a regional perspective, uh, we've covered that, we've covered that. So just from the, the corridor, most of you will probably have driven Durban, Meritzburg, or along the coast, uh, sort of Kopo to, to uh, uh, sort of Stanga, Kwa, we're doing quite a bit of work there. That's, that's our corridor. We look at the N3 corridor and we look at the N2 as, as being corridors. Um, the funding is SIP funding. Uh, it's worth your while Googling SIP. Um, uh, very big intention from national government and from the president. Sorry, sir. I'm not seeing some of the colleagues there. Are you missing me? My apologies if, if I'm not looking at you while I'm speaking. So I mentioned this. This is sort of a TEB filter in the center. Uh, workers started just recently, and uh, up here you would have experienced some issues with uh, sort of the Hilton sort of way. That's where we stopped, and then going south, we're looking at sort of Kopo uh, to, to Kwadubuza. That's the sort of length that we're looking at in terms of the corridor that we call the N2 and the N3 corridor. Quite a number of projects. Uh, it's probably about, what, 80 odd kilometers from Durban to Maritzburg, and then along the coast, another about 60 odd kilometers. But along that stretch, we're looking at probably about five lanes in each direction, uh, interchanges in the region of about 21 odd interchanges. So there's, there's quite a massive scope that we are tackling there. So uh, if we haven't said it previously, we do apologize for some of you being delayed in getting to your lectures um, because of roadworks. We know you are very keen to get early and on the time at the lectures as well. So it's on record. So uh, this is quite a, a difficult slide to read. I'm just going to skip over it, but it's just uh, one of the two of the slides that just gives us an indication of where we are with the projects. This is quite a, a key issue. We've, we've raised this in, in the earlier video, but uh, corridor development. And I was asked uh, by one of the colleagues, what do you mean by corridor? So corridor is, is, is the strip that, that we have the road, the physical infrastructure, but it's also the area of influence that gets impacted by the road itself. So there's businesses, there's schools, there's hospitals, there's transportation, multimodal. Like uh, our work itself also impacts on the harbor. Massive, massive issue. Our work impacts on the airport. Massive issue. If our harbor in Durban is the biggest in Africa, biggest port in Africa, you can uh, imagine the kind of impact that we're looking at. So this is a picture of... Uh, Anybody recognize it? The Oakstone Party in Durban, do you? Hey? What does it look like? This last picture. Well, Google the picture for me and tell me a little bit later. Okay. So, so this is unlocking the, uh, the, some of the areas that uh, we think are development nodes. There's a good number of other development nodes. This is uh, the uh, Gateway Crescent area. Yeah, quite shocking, eh? Sugarcane and then party places. So for myself, uh, I'm into pavements and materials. I'm a specialist within the, within the region and also nationally as well. On the N3, we have two kinds of pavements. One is rigid and the other one is flexible. The rigid pavement is CRCP. Um, this is uh, uh, a picture of the construction of the CRCP pavement. So those of you who are into gym, please put in on site. We've got a lot of pick and shovels and all sorts of things. You don't need to go to gym. You can be shoveling concrete on site. I did that when I started off, I'm proud to say. It's hard work. And this is the, this is the thing that perhaps those who are academically inclined need to understand and appreciate. That our people who lift the pick and shovel, they do it for eight hours a day. It's very, very hard work, very demanding. So when you do get to site, be mindful of that as well. Treat people with appropriate respect and care, respect their craft. Everybody brings something different in order to produce a product at the end. It's not just clever people who are grinding away at computers and so on at the offices. Okay, Just because you wear a jacket and a, and a shirt, it doesn't mean you are any smarter than the person who's moving the shovel on site. Without that person, you're not going to get a road. Do appreciate and understand that. So uh, on top of the concrete, we are going to put in a friction cause. This is in order to take care of of runoff, surface runoff, a lot of water, we've had a lot of rain, and then also reduce the noise as well. Supporting the, the, the concrete slab, we have an interlayer that uh, the concrete slab sits, sits on. A little bit technical, but you do need to appreciate and understand this as well, because when you're getting to work next year, these are some of the things you may well have to uh, uh, look into and be able to speak to in your interviews when you go for an interview. 
Um, I hope I'm not scaring you guys. <laughs> then there's a, a flexible pavement. Yeah, the key, uh, the key product is an EME. I don't know how to say the word in English, but you can Google it. It's got a French name. But essentially, it's a 1020 pen bitumen or binder that's put into asphalt, and the asphalt is like, how thick is that, sir? How many millimeters? 20, 20 millimeters, okay. <laughs> and support here is a cement fusion base. So, so top tip, uh, before you go to site, this is probably about one meter, right? And your foot step is about one meter. Do learn that. It does, it does help quite a bit once you're outside. Just on, on, on this here, so I didn't, uh, in the previous picture, I spoke a little bit about, so this here, the two materials are quite different. You can see concrete is all runny, looks like a porridge, and there's setting time, curing time. Quite important. For most of us, we will be ending up on site. The, the value and the technical insight that you will bring to these kind of operations, I cannot understate it. So the design, the investigation, design, documentation is one stage. However, construction equally demands and requires your, your skill set. So understanding the issues around concrete and concrete pavement and construction processes, how to put people in a certain particular area. How many people can you have around this small space? These are quite important issues and questions that will be raised and you'll have to answer as well. So this here is more mechanized. This is asphalt here in front. The big machine on the left, you will see that's a, a material transfer vehicle. Very important uh, for, for, for asphalting. And then on the right you see an asphalt paver, you will have seen it on site. So those of you who like your computer games, this asphalt paver has got a keypad that outstrips anything that you played on PlayStation or anything like that. So from a physics perspective, this is, this is very important to understand. There's probably about three different types of rollers that are aiding compaction here. You will be engaging on this kind of issue as well. So one product is rigid, the other product is viscoelastic. So from a, from, a, from a pavement performance perspective and from a design perspective, we're looking two, at two different kinds of pavements. All, all trying to carry a similar kind of load, which is extreme. So um, for me, this, this was, this was uh, uh, life-changing to a certain extent in that one of the colleagues that joined us on the flood assessments, um, he was like, you know, I'm into engineering because I'm going to get something out of it. By the time he went through the flood assessments, he had changed his mind. He was like, what do I do for people? What can I do for people? What can I do for my society? This picture was taken on, on the flood damage assessment that uh, we went out and we did. If you look very carefully, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see this? That's determination. Most of us have been there. That is the reason why you're sitting here. Because you went through something like that. I went through something like that. It's now your job to avert and make certain that our people do not go through this kind of thing again. Fair point? Fair challenge? Yeah? That is why you have taken up civil engineering, not so. In addition to making a lot of money. Yeah? Yes, yes, I'm getting the yes is quite loud. Okay, so this is, the, so I spoke about data. That's the new world that you're going to have to work in. Reclaim materials and climate resilience is the other variable that is going to define your career going forward, define you going forward. If you don't feel these things within yourself, you are going to struggle in the industry. If you don't feel that engineering is for social good, you are going to struggle. If you are just a straightforward technocrat, you are going to struggle. We don't build roads just for the hell of it. We build roads to make certain that it drives our country. It helps our people, helps our economy. So um, this is what you'll have to do on day one when you get to site. You'll have to design a matrix like this. <laughs> so uh, the intention on the, and, and not just intention, the actual, what we are doing on the N3 and the N2 corridor is reusing, reclaiming, recycling all of the materials that we have in the pavement. So currently your point of reference is that you have a specification 
that you use and you get dished out that I want G1, G2, G3, G4, asphalt and so on and so forth. And this is the, the quality and the characteristic of the material. And so it's somebody else's business to generate that material. It is now going to be your business to generate the material from the material that we have in our pavement at present. This is our asset, this is your asset, this is the taxpayer's asset that has to be reused. So reusing of material and recycling of material is dropping our carbon footprint, dropping our capital that we are requiring to, to draw further into the uh, road network. This is reusing the capital a couple of iterations over. So that little calculation that you do at the very end is what cost benefit something. Yeah, it's demonstration of that. So uh, this is a little bit of a cheat sheet um, going forward and right now you, you to prepare yourself for the industry, you should at least familiarize your be familiar at present right now with this document. It's a Cotto Draft Standard Specification 2020. It's available on the National Department of Transport website. It's also available on the Sandal website. This is the document if you get into roads and structures or anything around public sector work, this is the document that you will be working with continuously. So please, it's freely available, download it, go through the document. It's very instructive, very, very helpful. It will help you earn more money as well. Not so, uh, <laughs> okay, so within that document, there's also further guideline documents and references as well. These are South African industry websites, the Sabita, which covers the uh, asteroid related guidelines. Please, those documents are freely available, the internationally accredited documents. I cannot overstress how much of value you would be able to draw from that. Then there's the Society for Asteroid Technology. Look at their website, there's loads and loads of resources available there as well. And then from a concrete perspective, there's SEMCOD, um, where matters around concrete, resources are available, all sorts of guidance. Um, Zora, I, uh, how am I doing for time? Ah, 22 minutes. Thank you very much. given a very detailed and very interesting insight into um, how your engineering um, is realized in, in industry. So now what we'd like to do is we would like to call on Rwanda Sigaji, who Krishna referred to several times, because we felt it was important for you to hear the voice of somebody who was sitting where you are sitting today several years ago and who walked that journey from where you are and today she is an engineer in Sanral. And we would like we would like her to share with you her personal journey, some of the challenges she faced, some of the ups and downs, some of the unexpected discoveries that she made along the way. Um, to inspire you, but also to give you a very real feel of what your journey could look like. I'd like to call on Luanda, please. Thank you. So, my name is Luanda Sigaji. Just maybe to, to give you a bit of background for myself. So I'm from the Eastern Cape. I know you're guessing Kadefa, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm from Umtata. So I grew up in a village called Ichani. And then I studied uh, in, in that village. Then I moved to the city. I, I did my high school there. Then I eventually now had to move to university. So I did my first year in KZN. Which was scary because I moved away from home, you know, you're starting this new thing, you're thinking all the, because I don't know how the lectures went, but 
you started this already in, in high school. This you already know. And you know you've got to do a lot of work. So it was, it was a big chunk uh, to chew in. But it was, it, was, it was interesting. It was an interesting journey. And I then uh, got a bursary with Sandra. I was fortunate enough to get a bursary. Um, I started through my four years and then I completed in 2016. And then um, I was under then the five-year program. So Sandra has a five-year program that, um, well, it enables you to register with EXA. Okay, so I just want to share with you my journey. Uh, it's nothing too hectic, just for you to follow with me, okay? All right, so like I said, that I, I followed the five-year program. So in that five-year program, I did two years as a design engineer, and then another two years as a site engineer. And then eventually, I, I came back to Eastern Region in Peter Mar here in Peter Maritzburg to be a project manager. So I just wanted to maybe share with you that there are different roles. So now as you exit into the industry, there are different roles. So there's a client, there's a consultant, and then there's a contractor. So some of you will be working in different uh, roles. So as a client, so Sandal, for instance, is a client. So we need a service. Like for instance, we want a new bridge. Uh, we want a new road that connects this village. Or it can be a water pipe uh, that goes from this reservoir to a community somewhere. Or a new building. I've seen people constructing here. Or a new building, uh, maybe a new uh, faculty for you guys. So it can be anything. So that's the client that requires a service. Now, as a client, we get someone who's going to design that for us. So now the person who designed is a consultant. Okay? Then the design is done. There's someone who actually needs to construct it. Now that's your contractor. Now the contractor can be a bit naughty, so he needs someone to look after them. That's where then um, the, the consultant comes in. So the engineer oversees the work that's been done by the contractor. So it makes sense, eh? Mm -hmm. So you can either be on site, contractor, boots, while we don't wear heels, or you can be in the office, design, or um, uh, engineer, if I can put it like that, or be a client, like be a project manager. So my journey then, so it started in 2017. So I was at the TA in La Beja now. So at the TA, you do design there. So I did traffic analysis, I did geometric design, I'm sure you guys know your TRH17, horizontal alignment, vertical alignment, you do know. Yes, so now you're going to start putting that into practice. Look, it becomes a bit scary because you have all this information and now you need to apply it. So I did all of that hydrology. Who knows the drainage model? Have you noticed it has sand all on it? Not saying anything. But okay, then I moved on to site. Um, it was in 2019, so I was a site engineer. So I supervise construction works. Remember I was saying, you have a contract on site that's building what was designed. So there's someone who needs to oversee that the, the contract is doing as per the design. So that's what I was responsible for. I think this, this one was the most exciting for me to see something, you know, come to life. Because you know, sometimes when you're in the office doing your program analysis and you know, it seems, but it's exciting. But on site now you see it being alive. So I was on site in the free state, and um, it was like Krishna said that we are about making change. Like for instance, I'm not sure if you can see. This is a, a road um, near a community. You can see that it's very easy to cross that road. So there are kids who were traveling from one side of the road to the other. So after school they would just run through. There were a lot of accidents that were happening there. So now Sandro, as part of, of road safety. We then had a, pro a project um, to, um, so it's a, a pedestrian sidewalk. So we basically concentrate, so people don't cross randomly. So we had guardrails, so that they cross at only one point, so that we make sure that they're safe. So the, the driver already know to expect a person that's crossing. So it was so nice to see the kids actually crossing where they should be, and then the accidents were reduced. So that's part of what you're going to be, making a change. Because we, I mean, we know the accidents that happen to be part of, you know, changing lives. That's what you guys are. So exciting. In fact, you guys look so young and fresh. I'm sure we all going to be safe. <laughs> okay? And then, remember I was saying that someone needs to look over the contractor on site. Who knows what this is? Does anyone know what that is? That vibrating noise is. 
poker for great variety. So you leave that aside to avoid those surprises. Do you know what that is? Honeycomb. No one wants that. So, so that's the importance then of a site engineer. So you overlook the work of the contractor. We actually have a, you know, a checklist to check: is this the dimensions right? Is this done properly? As a site engineer, so you are part of the project itself, ensuring that it's as it should be. So you can see everyone is important. The client is important to identify the need. The consultant is important to see that things are done properly, and the contractor as well to make sure that this thing is actually built as it should be. Then my journey continued as a project manager. So now as a project manager, I'm in the operations and maintenance division. Krishna, I didn't want to get become too technical. <laughs> so in the operations and maintenance division. So what a project manager does, remember I was saying um, the client basically identifies the service. So we go, if for instance we need a, a new bridge, so we go and identify, um, so we, 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 we identify the scope, right? Then once we've done the scope, then we need to procure a service provider. So a service provider is your what? Consultant and a contractor. So once you have then those, you, your design starts. So as a project manager, you review the designs, right? Then the, once the designs are done, um, the project then commences. Then you manage your budget. So what's a budget? For every work that needs to be done, it has a cost my changuras to do it. So as a project manager, then you need to be managing that budget, as well as then you attend site meetings just to oversee that things are being done properly. If there are issues, then um, you know you engage with the site staff and uh, come up with solutions. All right? So who knows extra here? Everyone. Everyone knows. Okay. Very, very important. You know how with uh, doctors, lawyers, accountants, you can't just go and you know do accounting work without your CASA, right? So it's as important for us as engineers. I've, I've been so happy to see how our industry as well is being safeguarded by that. That not everyone can just come and practice engineering. engineering. So that's how important we are. So as soon as you're out of here, candidate, you must apply. As soon as you step out, you have your degree or your uh, qualification complete, apply. Very, very important. I'll be, just think of me as you do it when you, you leave this institution. Okay. <laughs> we all know this need, right? You don't know it. Ah, okay. You know, when you move into, so now this is varsity, you learned all these different things and you, I mean your brain is going, you've got this lecture, you've got a test, you've got an exam, and you're learning all these different aspects, there's roles, there's, you know, there's structures, there's all these things combined into one. And then my perception was, as soon as I step into the work environment, this big test is going to come away, I'm expected to now know all these things. Very important, I've just arrived. <laughs> because if you build this over expectation of you're going to stress, you're not going to progress. So it's, who, who watches Chaga Ilen? Okay, you know that one. <laughs> so remember how Chaga was training? He wasn't at war yet, but he was doing all sorts of training. So that's what you were doing here. So by the time he was in the war field, he was ready. So that's the in knowledge and training that you're getting in this institution. So that when you out there, you're ready for it. So you've just arrived, but you've been trained, okay? Um, so like I said, that there's these different uh, structures, there's all of this. When you get to the field, you need to find your niche. It takes time, it also took me time to find uh, my roles and my structures, where am I being? So just go out there, explore, Keep an open mind, right? And there's also an, a challenge when it comes to balancing work and personal life. Hey, guys, it becomes stressful. Eh? It becomes really stressful. I'm sure you've heard about, uh, you know, your mental health. I mean, we've seen so many things happening out there. 
there's so much pressure, there's so much expectation. You also want to prove yourself. It becomes a lot. So you need to balance it. You know, hang out with your friends, go to church, go hiking, do something that makes you happy. I mean, even for me, there are times when I'm like, hey, I don't want to wake up. I don't want to go to work today. Like, because it's a lot. But there are times when, like I said, you see the work that you've done, it becomes so uh, satisfying that it overpowers the times when you're like, hey, I don't want to wake up. So just, just remember, it's not always going to be very fulfilling, but there will be times when it, you, you know, it is what it is. And then another thing, another challenge, you work with the team. When, when I grew up, I was very introverted. Like I used to study on my own, do my own thing, you know, test, I'm doing my own thing. But when you come to the work environment, you work as a team. You need someone else for something else. You know, Krishna needs my traffic analysis so that it can feed into his statement. That, you know, from different departments, you need to work together. So it's very important that you learn to break out of your shell and then you work as part of a team. And then there's adulting. I'm sure you've heard this one. We all come from different backgrounds. What I want to say, when you get to the work environment, don't lose your focus. It's very easy to do it, but adulting gets tough, but don't lose your focus, okay? And then some lessons learned, what I've learned through my journey, to ask for assistance. So I remember when I was in Tabeja, right? So I was given this work, so just that I've just arrived. So I was given work to do, it was hydrology. So I was supposed to calculate flow. As you guys know, it fell in my own. What I did, first principles, okay, on the paper, it took me hours and hours to get it done. I was making mistakes. My numbers were not adding up right. My flow was doing the most. Only to find, there's a software in it man. You can just put in the numbers. But that's why you, you are given the, the fundamentals of the foundation in terms of writing it down so that you understand what it's about. Because you can, our lectures always say it's rubbish in, rubbish out. So that's why you need these fundamentals now. All right, and another thing, be open to learning new skills. How many of us here watch the podcast, the number one? I won't mention it by name. Uh, I don't know, but that one. Like, you don't miss an episode, you're always watching it. But how often do you go on YouTube and you learn about a bridge that's built in China or a new method of <laughs> using cellular equipment? Or even as simple as Excel. How often do you just search new ways to use Excel? That will go a long way. So, for every hour that you watch that podcast, Allocate some 30 minutes just to learn something new. So always be open to learning something new. There's so much to learn out there. And your brain is probably 100 points. Okay, and then developing healthy habits. So I love to go hiking, see some nature, and I love to go to gym. But since I've started working, it's been slacking. But now it's, you know, it's spring now, so I've gotten back to it. So you need to build these healthy, uh, healthy ha habits. Um, either you go shopping, I don't know who likes to go shopping. Then you are letting your money and go shopping, do your nails, do your brows, do your hair. It's so productive. So you need to build those healthy habits. Okay. And then, most importantly, guys, self confidence. It can be so intimidating that first day of work. When you see all these people, you know, doing their own thing, answering phone calls, they've got these, you know, papers of design, and they're looking at all these calculations. You know, the years that you've spent here and you passed is not for nothing. So you've got the maturity. When you get there, be confident in yourself. You've passed, you've achieved. It's, it's, it's not a waste and it's not fruitless. So just be confident in yourself. You're going to keep learning. The more you learn, you're going to make mistakes. It's not easy to make mistakes. I remember on side, I made a blunder, guys. Yo, it was a huge one. Yeah? So basically, so on site, yeah, you have a surveyor for the contractor. And then you also have a surveyor for the consultant who confirms the work done by the contractor, basically. So it was a culvert. So the contractor made the mistake, and then they said, okay, 
the road edges, yeah, so this is where the road edge is, because we know the slope in terms of the all. You'll discover it later. So the contractor put his pegs, consultant also put his pegs in the same place, and they said they were correct. So I went there, I was like, I, this carpet, it's too long. We need to chop it. And I didn't confirm that it was a climbing lane, so it's actually supposed to be long. Then my resident engineer, tall guy like this, is like, no, Rwanda, you need to be able to use your, your legs. And he's a tall guy. This is me tapu, me tapu. So you can imagine as short as I am, I was trying to catch up with that meter. So it was so embarrassing for me that I wasn't able to identify that that calvert was not supposed to be cut. So you make those mistakes and you learn and you, you gain experience and you become better. So take it one step at a time because if you overwhelm yourself, you're going to be the next statistics that hang themselves. You know, all these terrible things. So one step at a time, one step at a time. With experience, it gets better. Now, as parting words, very important, run your own things. Who, who runs here? Are there any runners here? Oh. <laughs> Because if the person who just wanted to finish that five, five days starts comparing to the person who wanted to decrease their time, they're not going to be happy. Yeah. So that's why it's so important to focus on your own race. I'm just so excited to see you know, these young engineers. Yeah, the future is bright. Thank you so much. on behalf of Sandro, we really do appreciate the fact that you've taken the time out. Um, I would like to apologize for my voice. <laughs> it is a bit hoarse. Um, I'm coming down with the flu, but because of how important um, this lecture is, I said I'm braving it out. Um, um, I, I just want to do share with you guys some of the bursary and opportunities that we have at Sandro. Um, we really do at Sandro take pride in each and every single one of you as students because we know the impact that you make within our organization and more especially those that are coming from underprivileged uh, backgrounds. We want to make sure that we bridge that gap and we want to give you equal opportunities into accessing um, education as well as the opportunities that we have at Sandro in terms of workplace. I'll just take you through some of our bursaries that we have. Um, traditionally, as you know, Sandro is, our core mandate is to 
build, maintain, as well as finance um, national roads. So our core mandate or our core sector lies within the civil engineering and the built environment. So predominantly, that is what we had previously focused our bursaries on. So all our bursary recipients were for civil engineering. But what we've noticed is that we want to extend that scope because in as much as you do the great work, we do need somebody from HR who's going to hire these people, who's going to maintain your wellness within the organization. We do need somebody from um, supply chain and procurement. As you would know, our job scope, we do a lot of tendering work, we do a lot of consulting work, so we do need all those fields. That is why we've now extended the scope. Um, but for you as civil engineering um, students, um, you will see the first row, it covers then all the, 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 the disciplines and faculties that we focus on. Um, we also look at electronic engineering. Um, environmental engineering has also become part of um, uh, the, the, the civil engineering department, so that plays a, a vital role for us as well. We want to make sure that outside of just building these amazing roads, if there's the ecology, we want to make sure that it is in the state in which we left it. If there's anything that we've removed, if there's anything that we've um, uh, taken out to make way for that road, we need to make and put it back. Um, one example is if you're driving around the N3, you'll see there's the yellow trees um, that are, are on the tree are, on, on the road. So what we do with those, um, if we are extending, we have a site where we plant them and just whilst we are constructing, but as soon as we're done, we put them back. Um, so that is sort of, um, part of what we do in Samuel. I've spoken about um, human resource um, as well as uh, supply chain uh, management. So those are all the. But what is it that we need from you in order to qualify? Um, you guys are already in university, so you would need an average of 60%. Um, to qualify for our bursaries. You must be below the ages of 35. Uh, obviously, you are within a registered um, uh, um, institution. Uh, we do focus on primarily on private institutions. You must be a full-time scholar. So um, if you are going to be doing part-time, unfortunately, we do not um, sponsor you. And then um, you must also, uh, in terms of um, the application, you must be able to, to apply and, and have inserted all that is required. So our bursary applications are quite detailed. They are available online on, on, on Sandro. If you go on our website, www.nra.co.za, you will see them. They are still up. Uh, these run from um, the 1st of June until the 30th of September. So we still do have some time. Um, I, I, we had wanted to come earlier. As you know, you guys had the strike that was happening. There are other uh, things that did prevent us from coming sooner. Uh, but we are here and we want you guys to access those opportunities. Um, You've heard firsthand from Rhonda, who is a... a, a a, 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 a recipient of this bursary in terms of how it changes your life. So we really do encourage you guys to take on the opportunity. Um, you will fill in a couple of documents. Um, we do look at your, your 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 financial background, obviously. We will look at your academic as well. Um, there are a number of factors, but all of that is outlined. Um, all our applications are online, um, so it just makes it easier for you to then apply. Um, in terms of what the bursary covers, um, I think it was interesting. Earlier in the year, we had um, somewhat of a, a networking session for all our students who had received bursaries. And we just wanted to get feedback as to, is this working? Where can we improve as well? And we were really amazed at how much the bursary and the extent in which it goes. Um, one of the students stood up and, 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 and brightly said that, because I have a son bursary, I really don't have the same challenges as my colleagues. I do not stand in line for a long line for an FSIS application. I don't have a problem where the money has not come into my account. Um, San bursary is always paid on time. Um, and the only thing I literally need to do is just study and focus. 
So that is a privilege that we want to share with you guys. We don't want you at varsity having financial problems. And some of them, the things that if you do get a full bursary that we cover, we cover your registration, your tuition, um, we cover your accommodation, we cover your study materials and any other equipment if you need. Um, we understand that your fields are different, whether it's a laptop or anything else that you would be required for your field. Um, we do cover those. Um, we do then um, do meals. Um, we also give you a living allowance. This is just for you to be able to navigate um, campus life. So, gang and gang and swing. Let's put it at that. Um, <laughs> Apply and you'll find out. <laughs> no, but it, it is a substantial. It is something that, like I say, it's a living allowance. It will get you really over and above all the things that we've already done. Um, and then we also offer access to our wellness program. Um, one of the things that are facing uh, youth is especially mental health. Um, it's not only that, but if you are facing financial problems, if you are wanting to manage, um, if you're having relationship problems, those are all things that are available for you in order to access. So we do have a fully fledged wellness program. This is free of charge. It comes with um, being a, a bursary recipient. Some of the other things that we are looking at is we are wanting to get um, a, a driver's license program in, in embedded into this program. We want to make sure that when you leave university, you are a fully fledged um, student and will be able to compete um, as you go out into the world. So uh, there is, like I said, it's a full bursary, then there's partial bursary that will just cover then your, your, your tuition, your accommodation, as well as then access to the wellness. So like I say, your financial background as well as your financial stability does play a role. So we do evaluate um, the, the need, uh, that, that need access. Um, as I stated, these are closing at the end of um, September, so you do have a week or two, um, please do go on our website. Um, if you do have any in inquiries or anything, uh, we are then available at external bursaries at nra.co.za. But um, it's self-explanatory, uh, you will see all the requirements, um, you'll need something like your ID, you'll need if there's a parent who has um, sent you pass, you put in your um, death certificates, you put in all the supporting um, financial um, uh, statements that are needed, um, you also have to put in the new academic records and, and things like that. Uh, but outside of that, in terms of workplace um, opportunities, we've got a, a, an array of other uh, um, programs that we offer, one being workplace integrated um, learning. We understand with some other institutions, um, you have then the two years of theory and then you will require an, an extra year of practicals. Um, others call it uh, e-learnership. We do at Sandville offer that um, to students. So you get then that um, 12 months to be on an actual site. Um, and the nice thing about that is that within the, the 12 months, you are going to rotate within the disciplines. So you're not only going to focus on one area, by the time you get um, through that, you'll be, um, you'll be well versed in, 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 in the engineering field. Um, with that, um, you do need a, a number of requirements, like your ID. You do need a letter from the institution. So um, that would say that you've completed your, 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 your two years and now you're needing um, work experiential uh, training. Please have that on the institution's uh, letterhead um, and then your academic record. Um, you then send those to internships. You can just take this for those who need it. It's internships with an S, E, R. That stands for Eastern Region at nra.co.za. So that's internships, ER, at nra.co.za. Um, and lastly, I just want to touch then on what Rwanda has shared, that we do have a, um, an engineering development, uh, development process, um, that's the Technical Excellence Academy, and that is based in Kiberka in the Eastern Cape. Um, as Samuel, as we said, we do have other regions, and that is where then our technical excellence is based. That program is a five-year program. 
how it's broken down is um, the first 18 months, you are going to be stationed in Kubecha. Um, so you will be then uh, within the T Academy. So there you'll be also allocated a mentor. You're going to be working on live projects, general projects, but you still have a mentor. You'll be doing, uh, as Ulanda has said, the, the, the different disciplines um, that there are. Then from there on, once you've completed that, you move on to the 18 months of the design um, stage. So in terms of the, the design um, uh, office, as general, we use um, consultants. So you will be uh, also within a consultancy. Uh, there, from design, you'll be doing, like, as one has said, you'll be doing the bridges, you'll be doing the roles and, and things. And what is interesting about design, you may do it um, a couple of times, but it's not an easy pick. It's not like, oh, I've done this before, there was a bridge that I've done, so I'm take the same design and put it there. Even though everything may look the same, there's a, a number of variants that will make it different. Um, the slope may be different, there's a, a number of things. So those are all things that you are going to need to learn and adapt, and also adaptability. Um, you're going to need to find new ways and new um, creative ways of making what you have work. Uh, because maybe there's an access road for this one that was not there, you need to create um, the payment or, or anything like that so that, that element is going to help you um, and once you've done your actual design stage then you go into the construction um, site there you see what you've done and what you've designed you see it in, in practicality um, and you are also going to be exposed to the entire site as Rolanda has pointed out there are mistakes that you're going to make but there are also great learnings that you're going to take with you into your professional life um, and then you are left with six months the last six months you are then back in office we place you at the various um, central uh, regional offices there you get them um, from a, a, a PM point of view but you are also then finalizing then your reports uh, to register for AXA as you said so overall this five-year program has prepped you enough in order that when you come out you are then a, a qualified professional engineer. And then it's not a guarantee that we take you on into the company. Obviously, you may be fortunate, like Kulwando, and then uh, become a junior um, engineer or a project manager and, and, and so forth. But obviously, we do prioritize our own. And if you've come in um, from the bursary program, you've gone to the TIA, you've become part of our, our, our family. So it, it's always in your advantage um, to, to, to go that route. Then, um, because the T excellence is quite a limited number of uh, personnel that can make it, we've also um, started implementing our graduates in training. So these are freshly graduated, they've come out, and then they come and work on site. They are assigned mentorships as well, and they are assigned actual projects um, on the Sandwell Road. Currently, it is a two-year program, but we are in, in, in talks and looking at extending that into a five-year program. But otherwise, um, from Central, I think that is some of the workplace um, opportunities that we do have, and we do hope to see you um, soon within our, our, our institution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nomte. So, um, I know that we are um, running a little bit over time, but uh, we do have a couple more really interesting presentations, and we talk about a bridge. Well, a bridge is two ways. So, we have Sandron on one side, and we have academia on the other. We have academia, and, you know, we focus on priorities that are shared and one of the priorities that is shared is road safety and I'm very pleased to ask uh, Jacob and Arvin to, or is it going to be Arvin, um, Sarju who is going to talk to us about road safety engineering within the DUT. Good afternoon, uh, students and colleagues. Uh, 
I'm going to provide a short uh, presentation on road safety engineering for engineers in training. So, if we look at road safety from a global point of view, the, the unfortunate reality is that um, data by the World Health Organization indicates that road accidents is actually the number one cause of uh, risk or cause of death for young people between uh, 5 to 29 years old. The, the World Health Organization has various initiatives in place. Uh, one of the initiatives is the Decade of Action for Road Safety from 2021 to 20, uh, 2030. And the goal is to reduce road accidents by 50%. You would see on the slide there are various uh, role, uh, stakeholders. You would get um, uh, engineering, um, departments, emergency services, um, legal, uh, legal uh, bodies, as well as uh, government authorities. All have a role to play in uh, road safety. The, the causes of fatal crashes, according to, um, again, data from uh, from the Department of Transport, uh, the, the primary cause are uh, due to human error, um, human factors. And our goal as uh, engineers, as young engineers, is to try and uh, mitigate these risks. Now, and one of the ways to mitigate the risk is to ensure that the infrastructure that we provide is, uh, is safe and is goes beyond uh, design guidelines. So there are cases, there are often cases where we have to look beyond minimum standards. Um, looking at uh, road safety from the, the perspective of EXA, uh, you'd see that uh, the, the EXA uh, code of conduct requires uh, engineering professionals to conduct themselves in a, in a specific professional manner in terms of various e ethical categories. So the categories are competency, integrity, public interest, environment, and dignity of the profession. In terms of how road, uh, in terms of how road safety may fit into this, it could be um, argu uh, argu arguably stated that one of the more important aspects of the code of conduct is in fact um, public interest. So a lot of our projects that we do is um, is primarily for the public, is for people, uh, is, is one of the primary goals. Road safety engineering also applies throughout the road life cycle. So from the planning and design, construction, operation and maintenance, as well as uh, redesign. So if you look at, for example, if you look at uh, construction, um, there you would actually look at safety in terms of uh, safety of one's own staff uh, on site, you look at Occupational Health and Safety Act. Operation and maintenance often involves road authorities. Um, so this would involve typically government departments. So looking at road safety from a, from a design point of view, uh, looking at this graph, you will see that often road safety is incorrectly viewed or, or design standards are incorrectly correctly viewed as being um, either you meet the minimum standards and you satisfy all requirements, but as young professionals we have to look beyond meeting minimum standards. Because often uh, meeting minimum standards does not guarantee that you achieve uh, your project goals, you would, you, would, you would achieve the safe design. Uh, for example, lane woods, curve radii, side distance. Uh, meeting the minimum cur curve radius does not guarantee that, um, that you would achieve a safe uh, design. For example, TRX 17 requirements, it's often required uh, to, to exceed these requirements. It's obviously a, a, a cost component uh, to, to going beyond uh, minimum standards. But often these costs 
the long-term benefits work out more cost-effective to, to, to spend uh, initial capital costs and to get the long-term benefits in terms of road safety. The various road safety assessment methods, so uh, you may be involved in if, if, if uh, working in the consulting in, uh, industry as a young professional, you, you may be a part of a road safety assessment and audit team. Um, another initiative is the International Road Assessment Program. The Highway Safety Manual is, is, a, is a very important guideline document in terms of uh, road safety. It's an American standard. Uh, it's not been um, uh, typically used in South Africa, but there is a lot that can be learned from these guideline documents, as well as accident prediction models. Um, the following slide describes uh, how one would uh, look at the International Road Assess Assessment Program. So it's looking at before and after studies. So the slide on the left shows a one-star rating for an intersection. Uh, this specific intersection uh, interchange is in, is in Ghana. And it, it indi a one-star indicates a very high risk for pedestrian safety. And once this uh, intersection was identified, the road authorities put in various measures in place. You would see there are uh, pedestrian crossings put in place, traffic signals, sidewalks. The median has been widened, widened and this has increased uh, the star rating to a four star rating, making it a much more safer site. This is an example in South Africa. Again, it's, uh, this is a uh, school. Uh, in close proximity to a school in, in Cape Town. You would see this specific crossing, there is actually uh, no, um, uh, no measures in place for the, for the uh, pedestrian crossing. And uh, what they've put in place is uh, pedestrian markings, traffic signals, and uh, widened sidewalks. These are issues that can be picked up with uh, road safety assessments and audits. You would see uh, this is a hidden horizontal curve. So basically it's a, a vertical crest curve that, uh, that is obscuring a, a minimum radius horizontal curve. So these type of issues would normally be identified with 3D modeling techniques. It's something that we should uh, be aware of. And it can be uh, a site for numerous uh, accidents in terms of head-on collisions. The driver does not, uh, especially at night, is not aware of the of the horizontal curve and can can go straight into the into, into the into the opposite uh, direction of traffic to into the other carriageway. Uh, another example of a high-risk situation would be the. Uh, where learners are forced to, to walk on the roadway due to lack of infrastructure, where there are no sidewalks. So this is a, typically a, a quite a high risk situation that, that must be avoided. So the, the role as young engineering professionals is to make sure, uh, is to put in the correct countermeasures in place, sidewalks, uh, traffic circles, guardrails, uh, to, to mitigate these type of problems. Uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Adegeji, uh, will continue with the uh, presentation. Thank you. All right, afternoon. Um, I think I'll just start from where Mr. Sajio actually stopped. I think one critical factor in terms of which he has mentioned about what we call um, its details around the um, road safety is actually what the human error. So human actually contributes a lot. And one of the things which we actually look at is the fact that what? There are various factors that actually contribute, talking about the roadway itself, but Sandra is doing a wonderful job, so there's no need to worry about that. Talking about what we call the environment, oh, that we might not be able to take care of that, but in terms of vehicles, people are driving good vehicles at the same time. But now, the driver and the occupant, actually there's a major problem. 
And also, let's not forget about the pedestrian which are actually using the road. So with all of that being said, you will see that what the human factor is actually what a very great element that needs to be taken care of. You would see, for instance, just saying because I'm lecturing here, you will see a speed limit of 120 kilometers per hour, and someone will say, let me test what's it called, the accelerator of my car. Probably let's go 160. There's a reason why what? The 120 kilometers per hour has been put in place. But also, I just want to touch that Mr. What's called Christina talked about data. And one of the studies which we're doing here at DET is the fact that what? Data actually rules. There's a way we communicate to each other, and the same way, in the same vein, there's a way what we communicate when we are driving. The way I would talk to Mr. Mongezi sitting here will be different with the way I would communicate to him. If I may ask by a what's it called? So you will look at what what we are actually having is the world which we are going into is more of a data, uh, what's it called? Big data in essence. So we'll see that what in the future, all of the data around are communicating with each other and communicating with the road infrastructure itself. And not only communicating with the road infrastructure, but also communicating with every other infrastructure which are available. And just a little bit of that, what we are doing at DUT is the fact that what we try to understand some of this communication. If somebody is indicating right, you already know what that implies, if you've gotten your driver's license. But, or not, as the case may be. But in essence, we actually what gathered some information around informal communication which exists on South African road. And I will just play just two videos. And the video is actually just pointed out to say if a truck is actually what? Actually driving ahead of you, you cannot see ahead. You understand? It's indicating. But it doesn't mean that he is necessarily what? Going to actually what? Overtake anyone. It's just giving you the right of way to say, okay, it's clear ahead of me. You can actually pass. And the question which we are asking here is the fact that what? What will the future be like with the details around what? Communication between autonomous vehicle and non-autonomous vehicle. And I don't know if you watch that. You know, this car on the other side is trying to inform the guys on the other side to say, oh, there is an accident. Or some cases whereby yours know is to say, oh, there's a traffic cop on the other side. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. If the good there is a badge, so put it that way. But what we are saying is this information is what these data, they are very critical. Because some of this information you are not necessarily being taught using your K53, but they are very critical. And studies have shown that what novice driver and professionals, you understand, have a different understanding of how these data are being actually what's communicated. And if there's a proper communication, what we are saying is if there's a proper communication between probably two drivers or between a driver and a pedestrian, then safety can actually be achieved. And if I just go to towards the last slide, which I will just conclude is the fact that what this study which we are doing at DUT actually we are trying to understand what this informal communication, which is more like in a way you can say sign language, you understand. You need to know that this communication do exist. And from there we are trying to see how we can classify them, talking about maybe in terms of safety, maybe I'm trying to warn you on something apart from a traffic cop. Any other thing that is important. All the and we are looking at it as to say, okay, yes, not necessarily changing K53, but we are saying that what there is a need for what awareness, you understand, which you get to all of this data that actually exists. And I can tell you, these are just little videos which are available. There are other videos on our YouTube channel which are actually there. And this data, you won't know that they actually do exist. Okay, let me let me just test our memory. If someone is using an hazard light on the road, what do you assume that is saying? You see, there are a lot of information. Somebody might be saying thank you, might be saying I'm in trouble, you understand, and the facts. So those are the things that we're trying to achieve. And the future of what we're looking at is what? How will the future look like with autonomous vehicle communicating with pedestrian vehicle? And maybe you like it not, autonomous vehicle will come into place, but I'm sure there will still be people driving their own car. So how will they communicate as a case may be? So with that being said, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so you would know that Sandrals 
long-term strategy has four strategic pillars. And among the four strategic pillars is road safety. It is something that is obviously key and an integral part of what Sanral does and, um, and our vision for, for the future. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, Mongezi Mkise to speak to us about pavements and materials. You'll have heard that Krishna is also um, a specialist in this area. So please come and share with us. Uh, greetings uh, to my colleagues, uh, all the duty team, and to our visitors, Sandra. We are honored for your presence in our faculty. Uh, I'll just have a brief uh, presentation on one of the stabilizing agents that you can use to improve our materials, our soils, and our gravel materials in order to improve the quality of that material so that it can have uh, better uh, strength in terms of durability and also be able to uh, maintain all the load that will be um, applied on top of the road. Uh, so that it can be able to give us the lifespan that we're actually looking for in our designs. Um, the studies entailed stabilization of feasible pavement using alternative materials. Uh, this study was conducted in 2012 I'll be doing the presentation in 2020. I'll be doing the presentation together with my colleague here, Mr. Atidechi. So the study is based on the global significance of road transport, transport challenges of sustainable pavement, the challenges brought about innovations on materials, which is our source of innovations. The edge we're looking at is an edge called uh, Fly Ash. Fly Ash is a product of the combustion of uh, coal and there's a, a product that comes up there as a powder which is called uh, fly ash. Uh, we'll also be looking on the, on the design model that was used to test this uh, designing uh, model of ours. Mr. Jacobs will be coming in in their part. Uh, fly ash as alternative conventional material is continuously gaining interest over the years. This type of agent is not normally used in our country, which is South Africa. So as we all know, in our country, the most used stabilizing agent will be our cement, metal cement, and lime. So we, at the start, we're trying to also reduce fire ash with a, a bit of mixture with uh, some cement at 1% to see if it can work uh, as an alternative to only using uh, lime and cement. Motives to this include cementious properties, which are prosolamic material, its availability and cost effective. As we all know, as engineers, the most important aspect when we're working is looking at the cost. Maintaining cost and minimizing cost as much as you can, with getting the required quality that you are looking for in everything that you are doing. Solving landfill problems, fly ash is also uh, useful when you are solving landfill uh, the problems. Yet, fly ash composition varies and thus it cannot be general, uh, generalized. In South African context, fly ash production of 50 million tons per year uh, is produced. Only 10% of these products have been utilized in this country. So this means that we, if we would increase our usage of this uh, stabilizing agent, We'll be having different types of agents that you can use, apart from the ones that are commonly used in our country, which is lime and cement. Um, the class C and class F types of, of fly ash are the ones that are available. However, in this country, uh, we, 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 we use uh, class F. The low usage related to consent of compilation of surface and groundwater during the leaching process. Uh, is also taken into account during our our process here that we are doing to see if we can create this model that can uh, sustain uh, a better uh, fly ash during our stabilization process. There's a quote here which we, which we derived from uh, 
Mustafa uh, Hassam, environmental aspect study by him showed the trace of amount of elements which might be leached to the groundwater when fair ash is used on road projects are not harmful. So as you all know, as my colleague just showed there, on our OXR code of conduct, so that we are always looking at making sure that we are, we are, we are preserving the environment and uh, also making sure that we are looking at making sure that the community safety and uh, looking at health and safety aspects. So this agent will also uh, fall in within those uh, categories. Based on our study, uh, a basic construction material for reproduction are used. We use the G5 natural gravel material specified for sub-base um, construction. This material was stabilized using different class F fly ash in South Africa, which are Kennedal Dam ash and Purapos uh, and Cosfield. So, as you all know, uh, stabilizing can be applied on both the sub base and the base. Uh, going forward, I will hand over to my colleague to take us through the model that we were able to use to find out the results. Thank you. All right, in essence, just a, uh, one call to give the details of how it was. We used cement to actually, what's it called, start the reaction of the fly ash. And like my colleague has said, fly ash, it's a byproduct. Like, think of your ex plant, you understand? The bone cold, and that is the result. And this is just sitting there, and if not properly taken care of, it can cause what's called, it can leach some chemicals into the groundwater. So, but using them, we discover that what, at this percentage, we discover that at 16% to 20%, there is what, a strength increase. And precisely at 18%, there was a good strength increase. And anything beyond the 20, what's it called, the 20%, then what's it called, the strength of the, what's it called, of the sub base actually begins to actually reduce. So you will see that the details here just talk about what, the UCS test, the ITS test, and you will see that what, this dump ash actually spoke, uh, speaks about what's it called the ashes which are taken directly from what from the dump site, and these ones are the modified one which is the poor or what's it called poor field and the pure pot. So and we discovered that what the strength increased and from a G5 material it actually improved it to a G3 uh, and a G4 as the case may be. And looking at that, we just went forward, up, which because of time won't do all the details. It's the fact that what we tried to model this rather than using our conventional design method, we used the finite element design method just to actually what's it called uh, the design model just to see how the behavior. And if you could see from this image, you will discover that the stabilized base, which was stabilized with fly ash, actually in terms of what's called resistance to the load we use the stationary load in this case, actually behaves much, much better as compared to what just the G5 material without any, what's it called, any details or uh, any stabilizer actually put in. And in conclusion, we actually come to realize that what base layer for flexible equipment actually, actually serves as a very good, uh, what's it called, structural element. And cemented hands, that is class F fly ash, can actually be used as an alternative stabilizer. And most critically, because we actually produce a lot. I think around the world, South Africa is sitting at number fourth or fifth position in the production of flash, which is a waste. You can leave it there, but it's actually just sitting there and can also cause contamination, which we're trying to preserve. So based on the analysis, we discovered that the FEM tools, that is the finite element tools which we use, has got a good potential for the design and the lab. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that research. Um, you know, part of the bridge that we build between um, academia and industry is exactly sharing the conclusions of research like this that feed into future practice in industry. So thank you so much for, um, for, for, for sharing that with us. And um, certainly the conversation 
will carry on in terms of looking at how to further and deepen uh, collaboration in this in this regard. So we're very near the end now, and um, just before I take your questions, as I mentioned earlier, road safety is one of the strategic pillars of Sanral. We're looking not just to build roads, but we're looking to build safe roads. But as you heard, the human element is by far, in fact, it's two thirds the reason for fatalities on our roads. And unfortunately, your age group is particularly susceptible because you are, um, you're, 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 la you're young, you're newer drivers, and of course, um, you know, when you're, when you're young, you're much, much less careful than when you get to uh, to, to to my age and to and to the age of some of the some of the other, other speakers. So I'm going to be taking your questions after this. But before I do, I'd just like you to pay attention to this road safety message. The next time you are on our roads.
so we will have the opportunity of uh, discussing further uh, uh, at the end of this uh, lecture um, over, over refreshments. Um, maybe, Dr. Darlington, you would just like to close for us. And we thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, colleagues, we have some of our staff here. We have some of our staff at, uh, right, right at the last extreme row. Um, I'd like to thank our our colleagues, our staff that um, joined us here. Um, and also, I'd like to give a special thanks to the members of Sandra. Um, for making this day possible. Uh, Zora being the, the champion, the, the organizer. And um, we we'll also like to thank Mr. Krishna, who is sitting here today representing the regional manager. Uh, the regional manager was uh, supposed to uh, be with us today, but um, I think there was a bigger meeting that came up, and he had to. Uh, part of this, uh, most probably, if we had this meeting in July, um, I think we would have had uh, the opportunity to have him. So what does this tell us? Less strikes. Less strikes when you... When you, when you uh, so, um, less strikes, more information, more opportunities. As you heard from Nomkevo today, you have 10 more days to go. If we had this, uh, this lecture in July, you would have had more time to apply. So it's, it shows that strike is most of the time negative. So I also want to thank Luanda. Uh, uh, who you saw here a junior project engineer and you saw how she has integrated all the way from Tata Eastern Cape. She came here and studied UK Reddit and today uh, she is living as the dream of an engineer. Um, so uh, just something I'd like to uh, filter through to you students today is don't don't fail to apply. Please, don't fail to apply for the bursaries. You have what Nam uh, Tebo said, they look after their own. They prioritize their own. Doesn't mean you cannot apply if you didn't get a bursary, but you stand higher chances when you got their bursaries. Okay. And I also like to uh, 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 say to every one of us here, Thank you for coming, the students. You are our clients. I always say this. We look and strive uh, towards better ways of serving uh, you and making sure that nobody is complaining. With this um, said, uh, I like to, before I close, just inform you that once you leave here, you make your way to the L block, second floor. Uh, all of you. Uh, so there will be where you will be, lunch will be served. Uh, I, 